Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Daniel Tanner. I'm a postdoc working under Eric Bousquet at the University of Liège, and it's a joint application with uh, Centrale Supélec in Paris under the supervision of Pierre-Emerick Janelin. Uh, so this is going to be on the calculation of electrostriction, how best to do it. Uh, electrostriction is an electromechanical coupling. So for example, it couples a strain to an electric field. And you're all probably familiar with piezoelectricity, which couples a strain linearly with an electric field for non-centric materials. But electrostriction is present in all crystal classes, and it couples a strain quadratically with an electric field. And so here's an expression for the strain, which includes the piezoelectric and electrostriction tensors. And in what follows, we're only going to be dealing with the electrostriction. Um, so there are actually a few types of electromechanical couplings described by electrostriction. The first is one which couples a strain to an electric field. There's another which describes the coupling of a stress to an electric field. And then we have uh, tensors which describe the coupling of a strain and stress to a polarization given by Q and small q. Um, so again, the, the aim of this work is to determine the best means by which to calculate each of these tensors in DFT. Uh, so the remainder of the talk, first I'll motivate why you'd want to calculate electrostriction at all. Um, then I'll motivate why there would be a methodological study by looking at the literature. Um, then I will show a derivation of the proposed method to calculate it and the advantages that you can discern already just from the form of the calculation. Uh, then I'll validate the method against existing uh, methods and experiment, uh, compare the efficiencies. Then I'll show some applications and summarize. Um, so as an electromechanical coupling, electrostriction is going to have a lot of applications in transducers, actuators, smart devices. Uh, but for a long time, electrostrictive strains were too small for this purpose. So electrostrictive materials were ignored. Uh, in favor of piezoelectric materials. Um, but that was until giant electrostrictors were found, um, which have more usable strains for applications. And th these have advantages over piezoelectric transducers of uh, generally they've got better temperature st stability, lower hysteresis, and they don't need to be lead-based materials. So this is Lamox, which is considered a, a giant electrostrictor and it has many of these properties. So, so this, this has motivated people to want to find more uh, giant electrostrictors and also to explain why giant electrostrictors are giant. People don't fully know that yet. Um, so in the literature, uh, uh, all, most calculation or all calculation of electrostriction has so far been using finite field methods and they've also all been using Abinet. So the first, uh, of which was by Korniev et al. And they used the finite field method. They did DFT under a condition of fixed electric field and relaxed the internal um, coordinates to get a stress. And we also have two papers which used the finite D field method. Uh, and again, they imposed a fixed displacement field and relaxed around it. Um, so th again, these all use the, uh, what we'll call the direct electrostrictive effect, which will be, um, relaxing the measuring the relaxation in, in result to a field um, but not all the possible methods are represented in the literature and that's why we will need a methodological study that's what motivated this study um, so to look at a new way to calculate electrostriction we start at the gibbs free energy and its differential uh, on the left we take the first derivative uh, with respect to stress and we get the negative strain and we know that the strain can also be expressed by the um, electrostriction relation. And we're dealing here with materials where there's no piezoelectricity, but it wouldn't make a difference to the derivation anyway. Uh, on the right, then, we take a derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to electric field. We get the negative of the polarization, and we know that the polarization is related to the field through the susceptibility. And um, proceeding on to the third derivatives, on the left, uh, we take another two derivatives with respect to E. Uh, so this differentiated by E twice gives you minus two times the electrostrictive tensor. On the right, we differentiate here by Ej and then by the stress, and we get uh, minus the derivative of the susceptibility with respect to stress. 
So these are two third derivatives of the energy with respect to the same variables, but interchanged. So we can equate them to each other. And then we can have that the electrostrictive tensor originally uh, normally formulated in terms of a second derivative of the strain with respect to a field can also be calculated as the derivative of the susceptibility with respect to stress. Um, so as we've seen, there are, uh, there are other electrostrictive tensors um, introduced earlier. And uh, using different free energies, we can get similar relations for all of them, which all involve um, derivatives of either the susceptibility or the inverse susceptibility with respect to stress or strain. And um, so before even doing any calculations, you can see that there are some uh, advantages that will accrue to the, to the new method. So the indirect method involves um, stressing or straining a unit cell and then using DFPT to calculate the permittivity or inverse permittivity, whereas the direct method will involve uh, applying a different uh, electric field and then relaxing to get a stress or strain. Um, so the advantages of being able to apply a stress or strain means we can apply a hydrostatic stress or strain. Um, so we can do calculations which don't disturb the crystal symmetry and this can result in things like so for a cubic uh, centrosymmetric material, we can do one calculation to get um, the electrostriction uh, without the need for any relaxation. But with the direct method, we'll always need to apply a unidirectional field and we'll always need to relax as a result of that field. So that's always gonna take longer. Um, also in the direct method, we have a condition relating the band gap and the K-point grid density to the electric field strength. Uh, which prevents its application in certain areas. This doesn't exist for the indirect method, so we can investigate materials um, which have a shrinking band gap, and you know that's interesting for electrostriction as well. Uh, so the indirect method, through the decomposition of the permittivity, which is um, easy to do in DFPT and available in Avenet, we can also decompose the electrostriction tensor. We can see which modes contribute the most to it. Um, this is much harder to do in the uh, finite field method. And finally, just in terms of infrastructure, the FPT has been around since the 90s, whereas uh, these finite D field and E field calculations have, uh, are, are much newer. So for example, in Abinet, the fixed D field method, it can't be parallelized. And we also have that in Abinet, um, the finite field methods uh, under PAW don't, don't work correctly. So I've shown here the polarization as a function of electric field calculated with DFPT and finite field methods for both uh, norm conserving pseudo potentials and PAW. Uh, so what you see is the, uh, the red here, the norm conserving pseudo potentials, the two lines overlap, but for the blue, which describes the finite field method, we have, um, we have that the Norm conserving pseudo potential agrees well with these other uh, ones, but the PAW finite field gives incorrect polarization versus electric field. And this means it'll also give incorrect electrostrictive uh, coefficients. Uh, whereas we can use this new method with DFPT and PAW on lar larger systems. So that's an advantage. So in general, we can say that the indirect method here is more robust, more efficient, and easier to implement. Um, so now we'll go into the, to prove that with some calculations and then to compare the actual things after running. So use a DFPT and Abinet with a cutoff energy of 50 Hartree, eight by eight by eight, pseudo dojo norm considering super potentials and PB sol. And we apply it to rock salt MGO as a, a test system. Um, so first to do the indirect method, we took a magnesium oxide unit cell, strained it between plus or minus 5%, calculated the uh, susceptibility and inverse susceptibility. And by computing various derivatives here, we were able to get all four uh, electrostrictive coefficients at once. And this is a hydrostatic strain. So we're getting these um, hydrostatic uh, electrostrictive coefficients, which is just a single number from the tensor. Um, for the finite field method, uh, we again took the magnesium oxide uh, unit cell, um, applied different values of um, 
electric and polarization field and then relaxed at these um, values. Uh, so we saw that we get a, uh, an expansion uh, parallel to the field, a contraction um, uh, perpendicular to it. Um, and it's displaying the correct quadratic behavior here as we can. And we extracted the M and Q coefficients here from the um, slopes of these quadratic curves. So we also had to do a separate set of calculations to get the um, stress-related coefficients, these small Q and small M ones. Uh, in this case, we applied the electric or polarization field and then performed a relaxation holding the uh, lattice constants fixed. Uh, so with the coefficients calculated uh, using both methods for uh, magnesium oxide, we went on to compare the results with each other and with experiments. So in this figure here, we have uh, values normalized to experiment one, which is the first experimental value of uh, magnesium oxide. And then we have the finite field in orange and DFPT in red. Uh, so in all cases, we see that the, uh, the uh, theoretical values lie between the experimental values. And in most cases, aside from here, we find that the DFPT is closer to the experiment. So these are um, four different electrostrictive coefficients that we compared with experiment in this way. Uh, we also showed that um, calculating the electrostrictive coefficients using DFPT, shown here in blue, uh, gives a much better convergence respect to K points and cutoff energy when compared with the finite field calculated ones. So you see the, these are in red and they're all still uh, less converged than the completely converged on this scale DFPT calculated ones. So it, so it converges faster. You can do the same calculations on a smaller K point and cutoff energy grid, but also uh, for a given um, calculation at a given K point, uh, density and cutoff energy, we found that the DFPD calculations were eight times faster compared to the finite field with the relaxations. Uh, so with the method validated and shown to be more efficient and fast, I'm going to show some applications. Uh, so the first application is to examine electrostriction at a ferroelectric uh, phase transition. Uh, so if we take uh, potassium tantalate and increasingly strain it in the plane and look at the behavior of the Z component of the permittivity, we'll see that it uh, diverges. And we can attribute this divergence to a, a ferroelectric phase transition as we see this uh, lowest frequency, but also most polar mode um, tends to, to become towards zero and then pops up again. Um, so we can, at each stage of this uh, uh, compressed potassium tantalate, we can then apply a pressure in the Z direction and calculate the electrostrictive coefficient. And we find that M33 also diverges. Uh, it also gets huge as you go towards the ferroelectric phase transition, as you would expect. Um, and so to compare it with the uh, current piezoelectric um, device technology. This, this gives us uh, 60,000 uh, picometers per volt. Uh, and you can compare that with uh, PZT, uh, lead containing piezoelectric, which only has 162. So we've got a lead free, you know, non hysteretic, et cetera. All the advantages that we saw earlier, we can see them here uh, in this, what could be considered a giant electrostructure. We can also use the decomposition of the electrostrictive tensor to show that the, um, the reason M33 is diverging is also because of the contribution of this uh, soft polar mode. So the green line here is the electrostriction, or the purple dots are the full electrostrictive coefficient. And the green line here is the contribution of this mode this purple mode to the, to the things. And, and so the other contributions of the other transverse optical modes in the, and the um, electronic contributions to the electrostriction, these are all negligible on this scale. Um, another application is, uh, we showed that materials with a large Q electrostrictive coefficient aren't necessarily materials with a large 
m electrostrictive coefficient. So shown here, we've got a log of the Q electrostrictive coefficient plotted against the uh, elastic compliance over the permittivity. We have this for various materials. And on the right is a color bar, um, which represents the magnitude of Q. So as you can expect in, the, in this figure, the, uh, the colors increase as Q increases. Um, on the right, we have the same, but now we have MH plotted against uh, the elastic compliance multiplied by the permittivity. And so you can kind of, and again, the color bar is QH. Uh, so the purpose of this is it shows that where MH is large, QH can be small. Where MH is small, QH can also be small. And there's a sort of, uh, there's no clear correlation here. Um, so a large strain response to an electric field does not necessarily mean a large strain response to a polarization field. Uh, so to summarize, we showed that the stress strain dependence of the permittivity is the um, most efficient way to calculate electrostriction and the most useful. Uh, we validated the method. Uh, we demonstrated it, it had advantages of fewer calculations, faster convergence, uh, faster compu computation time for a given set of parameters, uh, allows more insight into electrostriction by the decomposition of the tensors, and I showed two applications. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You are perfectly on time. So we have a question from Massimiliano. Are you familiar with the issues between proper and improper piezoelectric tensor? Um, well, I am now. <laughs> Thanks to the last time you asked that question. Um, so yes, I am familiar with them. And so uh, that is also an issue here. What I can say for certain is that that's not going to um, affect this method of calculating electrostriction. Because even though we're using finite fields, uh, at each point we're computing the permittivity in Abinet, which uses the, uh, the scaled um, electric fields. So in that sense, the issue won't come in. Uh, whether or not you can cleanly say, uh, so going into the other sense, you have your improper uh, piezoelectricity tensor where you look at uh, you know, the change in polarization with a strain, and you've got these spurious terms due to uh, with the rotations or the, um, the volume effects. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to compare that because, um, so it's, if, 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 if it were, um, <laughs> sorry, because we're applying an electric field and then looking at a strain, or we're applying a polarization and then looking at a strain. We're not applying a strain and looking at a polarization. Um, I think those effects will still be there, but it's, it's more difficult to say exactly how they would cause a different tensor. And, and even um, when you think about the, uh, when I think about that from the perspective of piezoelectricity, I still, I can understand it from polarization as a, a result of strain. But if you look at the converse piezoelectric effect where you talk about mm. strain due to polarization, it gets more confusing for me. Yeah, Daniel, may, may I, may I uh, let me briefly clarify. Uh, so do you hear me? Yes. yes um, I just see, see only half of your face. I don't see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I think there is a difference uh, in, in your method uh, at, at the moment where you take the derivative, uh, the finite difference in, in, this, in, in the deformation of the cell. So you have your dielectric tensor calculated at various... Uh, so uh, I think the difference is, lies between taking the derivative of uh, whatever you have in the AnaDDB file yeah. or uh, taking the differences in the Cartesian tensor, in the Cartesian dielectric tensor. But, so uh, I think there is a difference there, whether you multiply before or afterwards by the uh, usual transformation between reduced or um, Cartesian coordinates. But we, we, can, uh, we can discuss uh, probably later. It's, uh... OK. Yeah, yeah that, that, that would be interesting. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So uh, if uh, there are no other questions in the comments, I have a very naive question. You, when you showed your QH and MH, which are uncorrelated. Yes. Um, and then uh, in your first slides, you mentioned possible applications. 
Can yeah. you explain uh, what is better and uh, worse for applications between QH and MH? Um, <laughs> is it QH is uh, important and M MH is not? I think MH is more important um, ah. because MH is going to describe electric field. So you, electric field related to strain. And I think that's what people are able to apply mostly in applications. I mean, the polarization is kind of a, an internal thing, I guess. But yeah, that's as much as I know about that question. Thank you very much. There is also another comment from Eric Bosquet. In paraelectric crystals, the proper improper does not exist. Now in polar phases, we should be careful to be discussed. 